When we watch the wars of the world playing out before our eyes, it's understandable to feel a range of emotions. Sometimes those emotions are shock and horror in the face of tragedy. Sometimes anger or frustration, sometimes hope. Victory can bring jubilation, defeat can bring heartbreak, and waiting can prove at times to be agonizing. But it's not often that a global headline from the heat of battle causes us to squint, scratch our heads, and say, what was that about? Yet, in our lead story today, we're going to spend some time in that very feeling, because Russia just used its most sophisticated fighter aircraft to shoot down its own most sophisticated drone. The incident took place over the skies of Chasov Yar, a patch of eastern Ukrainian land that used to be a town, but has now passed the six-month mark just a few days ago since it was turned into an incredibly bloody battlefield. Chasov Yar is an immensely important strategic location for both the defenders and the invaders of Ukraine, and after the devastating battle of Bakhmut ended in Russia's favor, it's Chasov Yar that's been a critical point of defense to stave off a Ukrainian collapse in the region. The fighting has been very very intense and just as attritional as the fighting in the other worst spots of the Russia-Ukrainian war. At the time of writing, Russia is making minor advances into critical portions of the city, although it doesn't appear that a Ukrainian collapse is inevitable quite yet. But the thing that happens over Chasov Yar on October the 5th was related only tangentially to the state of affairs on the ground. About 10 miles behind Ukrainian lines, closer to Konstantinivka than Chasov Yar proper, video shot from the ground appeared to show an aircraft in flight but not just any aircraft. The plane was an unmanned drone known as the S-70, referred to in Russia as the Okhotnik B and in NATO nations as the Hunter B. Then, as the S-70 is in flight, a plane believed to be Russia's purportedly fifth-generation fighter aircraft, the Sukhoi Su-57 Felon, fires an air-to-air -air missile at the drone. The S-70 is seen falling to the ground and trailing smoke, and after the fact, on-the-ground recovery of structural elements confirmed that it was indeed an S-70 that was shot down. Ukraine operates neither the S-70 nor the Su-57. This was Russia on Russia friendly fire. And once we start digging into the implications of such an incident, it becomes very clear just how strange this is. First revealed to the world in 2019, the S-70 is an incredibly rare aircraft with just two known production line copies of the plane currently flying. Designed in a flying wing configuration, the drone reportedly uses stealth coatings and composite materials to give it a very small radar cross-section. It's similar in shape and size to an American drone, the RQ-170, a copy of which was captured by Iran in 2011. It features internal weapons bays, and according to Russian state media, it can hit top speeds of 1,000 km an hour or 620 miles per hour, flying at a range of 6,000 kilometers or 3,700 miles. It's believed to be in production as part of Russia's Loyal Wingman program, an ongoing effort to provide its most advanced fighter aircraft, the Su-57, with unmanned counterparts that can carry additional ammunition and generally take part in a fight. That's not to say that the S-70 is about to be dogfighting with manned fighter aircraft autonomously, far from it in fact, but it's still a valuable way to multiply the offensive value of a manned fighter aircraft, something that the US and other nations are working hard to do in the coming years. But the purported sophistication of the S-70 and the sheer rarity of the aircraft in 2024 was apparently not enough to stop it from being shot down by its piloted flying companion. Although it's difficult to verify details like this, it's not terribly likely that the S-70 and its accompanying Su-57 were in imminent danger from a Ukrainian aircraft or air defense system. Although that area of Ukraine airspace is thought to be well saturated with air defense batteries, those batteries would have taken out both aircraft long before they got past Chasov Yar if, indeed, Ukraine had attempted a shootdown. Why that shootdown never came is unclear, especially given the potential for Ukraine to take out not just an S-70, but an Su-57 fighter. Nor was the drone simply an inert aircraft. Photos obtained of the wreckage indicate that it was loaded with at least one precision-guided glide bomb. And compounding the weirdness of the situation, it's also highly unusual for Russia's Su-57 to be anywhere near the Ukrainian battlefront at all. Russia has been hesitant to put its newest toy in danger, perhaps owing to concerns that Ukrainian radar might confirm what much of the world suspects, that it's not nearly as stealthy as Russia claims. The presence of both aircraft together over Ukrainian skies led to well-founded speculation that they may have been participating in operational testing, including potential live-fire tests in which the S-70 would have carried out a precision strike in its loyal wingman role. But if the S-70 was participating in such testing, then why was it shot down? One possibility is a system failure. The plane's operators may have lost connection to it, or it may have had some sort of onboard malfunction or been caught up in areas where Russian or Ukrainian jamming interfered with it. 
The drone is likely to rely on a radio link to operate as on the ground back in Russia, since AI technology to fly such a drone is believed to be a very long way off for Moscow. In such a turn of events, Russia would have known that the S-70 was likely to be unrecoverable, and in that case, shooting it down would have made some sense for two reasons. First, it's a way for Russia to save some face in the event that it got lucky and nobody recorded the incident. Second, it's a way for Russia to destroy sensitive technology that it may not want falling into an adversary's hands, especially with the high possibility that the collected wreckage might make its way to NATO. But another possibility, and one that would have led to the same destructive outcome, is that the S-70 might have been compromised by its adversaries. Such a turn of events isn't unheard of for unmanned drones. The aforementioned American RQ-170 that Iran captured in 2011 was hacked, commandeered, and landed safely by Iranian cyber warfare assets. Ukraine, a fighting nation known for both its operational innovation and its undeniable drone-related tech savvy, could very well have pulled off a similar feat. But whether that account of the S-70's shoot-down is accurate or not, the intelligence value of a shot-down S-70 goes far beyond just being able to hack its system. The drone crashed in Ukrainian territory, and despite any attempts to destroy it, the wreckage includes several largely intact pieces, including almost the entire left wing. An apparent Russian attempt to hit the crash site with a short-range Iskander missile was similarly unsuccessful in breaking apart useful wrecked pieces of the aircraft. The remains of the drone were scooped up and taken to parts unknown by Ukrainian defenders, but not before being extensively photographed. Perhaps the biggest finding would be related to the aircraft's stealth, or maybe even a lack thereof, with some analysts suggesting that the shot-down S-70 was either modeled after a non-stealthy prototype or didn't come with the stealth materials and coating that were promised by Moscow. Not only that, but the S-70's component materials likely share a lot in common with the Su-57, so the wreckage grants Russia's enemies a chance to study that as well. It's exceptionally unlikely that NATO nations would glean anything from the S-70 that they would want to graft into their own future aircraft. But by studying the wreckage, another outcome is substantially more likely. With enough data, those same NATO nations can work out how to best target and counteract the S-70, potentially giving a checkmate to Russia's stealth fighters, pun intended, by learning to locate and target their loyal wingmen, even if the fighters themselves really are able to avoid radar. According to one former Pentagon official speaking with the U.S. outlet Air and Space Forces magazine, the crash could provide, quote, tremendous insight into Russia's mastery of stealth technology or any lack thereof. Of course, there's a non-zero possibility that all may not be as it seemed over Chassiv Yar. As one military analyst interviewed by Air and Space Forces magazine explained, there's a chance that the incident may have been staged in a deliberate attempt to distract or mislead NATO or Ukraine. That might have been done by using an old prototype that's since been discontinued or by sacrificing a production model of a drone that Russia has since realized isn't worth their investments, or it might even involve using an altered version of the drone with elements meant to mislead Western analysts. Such a deception would not be outside Russia's operational capabilities, but it would certainly be unusual. Some elements of the shootdown incident suggest that Russia might have sacrificed something less than the latest model S-70. Some sources suggest that the downed drone closely resembled an early prototype rather than the S-70 currently in production. But the presence of a rare and valuable Su-57 sent in to shoot it down represents a risk that Russia may have been less willing to take if the incident had been planned in advance. Whatever the truth of the situation, Ukraine and almost certainly its international partners in NATO now have something intriguing in their possession. The intelligence value of a captured S-70 won't truly be known until it's been fully analyzed, and even then, most of the findings probably won't be disclosed to the public. But in a war where testbed technologies are abundant on both sides, and where the capture and analysis of adversary technology isn't unusual, the events near Chasiv Yar might be the most important instance of technology capture of the entire Russia-Ukrainian war. So, for a brief moment this spring, it was one of the biggest news stories on the planet. When Haiti's government collapsed under the pressure of a gang uprising, you could barely move for the wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Social media hummed with rumors of violence so extreme it felt like something out of a post-apocalyptic movie. Even in our humble corner of the internet, it was clear that audiences were desperate for information. Two videos we released covering the collapse both racked up more than a million views. Eventually, though, that interest waned. As a contingent of Kenyan police arrived to help tackle the armed groups, the story began to slip from the headlines. Today, it's common to go on the front page of news sites as diverse as the New York Times or Fox News and see no mention of Haiti at all. Yet this sudden silence doesn't mean that the crisis is over. In fact, recent reports have suggested that if anything, it's only getting worse. To see what we mean, 
look no further than the awful events that hit the town of Pont Sunday on Thursday, October the 3rd. Shortly before dawn, dozens of members of the Grand Griff gang rode in on motorbikes armed with assault rifles. Over the next couple of hours, they systematically slaughtered 70 people, including elderly women and newborn babies. As one survivor told AP News, quote, they tried to murder everyone. If confirmed, the death toll would make the Pont Sunday massacre Haiti's worst since at least 2018. But it's also noteworthy for another couple of reasons. One is the utter failure of the authorities to do anything about it. According to the Miami Herald, Grand Griff leader Lucas Elan had been threatening the town on social media for weeks, accusing its citizens of sheltering a vigilante group that took down one of his roadblocks. But rather than increase the security presence in Pont Sunday, the police ignored the warnings. While such a reaction might seem shocking, it's really just part of the complete breakdown of law and order in the country. The International Organization for Migration estimates that 700,000 Haitians have now been forced to flee their homes due to the violence, half of them children. Meanwhile, the UN claims that a staggering 3,661 people were murdered in the first six months of 2024 alone. To put that figure in context, a similar number of killings across the second half of this year would give Haiti an annual homicide rate of roughly 63 murders per 100,000 people. Last year, a murder rate of 45 per 100,000 was enough for Ecuador to declare itself in a state of internal armed conflict. Even before this latest massacre, homicides in Haiti were off the charts. The second thing that makes the attack on Pont Sunday worth paying attention to is the location. Lying deep in the agricultural Artibonite region, the town is roughly 100 kilometers from the capital of Port-au-Prince. And that's important because Haiti's recent implosion was, for a long time, really the story of Port-au-Prince's implosion. While the capital fell to bloodshed and gang control, the rest of the country remains comparatively stable. Until now. With Kenyan-backed mission in port prince the armed groups are trying to expand outwards into other provinces. The Financial Times writes, quote, In August, violent gangs retook Gansie, a town east of port prince after Kenyan and Haitian officers retreated and have expanded their presence northwest to Cabaret and Arache. Now they appear to be aggressively expanding into Artibonite, likely in an attempt to take control of Route Nationale No. 1, which links the capital with the northern port city of Cap Haitian. The problem? Artibonite is Haiti's agricultural heartland, the place that grows much of the rice people need to survive. By attacking farming communities, the gangs are supercharging what's already a major hunger crisis. Here are some numbers. Of the 11.58 million people living in Haiti, nearly half are struggling to feed themselves and their families every day. Two million have been classified by the World Food Program as facing emergency levels of hunger, meaning a population roughly equivalent to that of New Mexico is facing acute malnutrition and disease. According to the WFP, this makes Haiti, quote, the worst hunger emergency in the Western Hemisphere. Nor does the bad news stop there. In some of the displaced people's camps, the first signs of famine have been detected. To be clear, only about 6,000 people are currently facing famine-like conditions. While that's obviously 6,000 too many, it still pales in comparison to the millions who could soon starve to death in war-torn Sudan. But the point isn't that Haiti is the worst crisis on the planet. The point is that perhaps no other nation is suffering a crisis that's so utterly unnecessary. Unlike in Sudan, where large swaths of agricultural land have been burned and marauding armies blockade entire cities, Haiti is still producing and importing food. Markets are still selling essentials. People aren't starving because of a lack of anything to eat, but because inflation and tolls levied by gangs have pushed food prices through the roof. The Guardian reports that buying enough food just to avoid starvation can cost a Haitian family 70% of its total budget. By disrupting agriculture, gang attacks in Artibonite are likely to push these costs even higher. As Angeline Anestius, president of Haitian NGO collective, cadre de liaisons into organizations, told the paper, quote, What we're witnessing in Haiti isn't a food shortage, it's a full-blown hunger crisis. Frustratingly, this is one of the major issues that the Kenyan-led police deployment was supposed to solve. Authorized by the UN Security Council, the mission was supposed to be a light-touch alternative to a full-blown military intervention. A force of over 2,500 police officers under Kenyan supervision would join with the Haitian National Police to wrestle vital infrastructure out of gang control, dismantle roadblocks, and ensure that food aid and medicine could reach the starving masses. Arriving in late June, the deployment had initial success, taking back control of port prince's main airport. Since then, though, victories have been thin on the ground. The reasons why the Kenyan-led mission is failing are legion. 
This fact that the Haitian police force the deployment was supposed to work with has been gutted. Of the remaining 7,000 officers left in the country, only 20% work in frontline roles. Then there's the fight back from the gangs who have turned entire neighborhoods into death traps. But really, the problems boil down to two missing things, men and money. On the manpower side, Reuters reports that the vast majority of policemen promised by other countries like Benin and Jamaica have barely begun to arrive. As a result, what should have been a force of over 2,500 is trying to operate instead with only 400 officers. However, it's where money is concerned that things have gotten really bad. From the outset, the UN estimated that the mission would cost $600 million. So far, the US has donated about half of that, with Canada, France, and Spain each supplying a few million dollars more. The rest, though, has failed to materialize. Without the money, armored vehicles used to enter gang-held territory sometimes break down due to lack of repairs. In August, The Economist reported that the Kenyan officers hadn't been paid properly in two months. Unsurprisingly, stuff like this tends to affect both morale and the success rate of operations. Speaking to the Financial Times, interim Haitian leader Gary Kenile noted that, quote, it is a two-pronged issue, not enough people and insufficient equipment. You can understand why four months into this, we're not yet finished with one neighborhood. Now, it's not impossible that at least the manpower problem will be solved going forward. The UN recently extended the policing mission by another year, and multiple countries have promised to add their guys to the deployment soon. Funding, though, might be more of an issue. To ensure a steady cash flow, the US and Ecuador recently put forward a joint proposal to upgrade the mission to a full UN peacekeeping operation, only to shelve the plan after Russia and China indicated that they'd veto it. And while Uncle Sam has deep enough pockets to just fund the whole thing alone, no one wants it to look like the deployment is doing America's dirty work. This, then, is the root of the problems plaguing the deployment, a lack of interest from the wider world in solving the crisis. The crazy part? Stopping Haiti's descent would doubtless benefit its neighbors. Right now, the Dominican Republic is deporting tens of thousands of Haitians a week to try and stop the gangs gaining a foothold across their shared border. The White House is said to be nervous that continued chaos will spark a wave of irregular migration to the USA. Other Caribbean countries fret that a lawless Haiti could export drugs, weapons, and chaos across the region. Yet the world continues to act like the crisis can be solved by an underfunded, undermanned police force taking on the gangs while unelected elites work towards holding elections. One of the main tasks of the country's transactional council put in place following the previous government's collapse in spring is to schedule a vote for 2026. Instead, Voice of America reports that three of its nine members have recently been charged with bribery and corruption. In short, no one is currently rising to the challenge. And that means the violence and chaos afflicting Haiti may continue for a very long time. This might be a grim note to end on, condemning as it does the citizens of Haiti to more trauma, more abuse, more misery. But it's also a warning. Because if Haiti's meltdown really does continue, if the gangs really do continue to grow in power, then there will likely come a time when the chaos won't be contained at Haiti's borders. And with Florida a mere thousand kilometers away and Puerto Rico only half that, it could be that the effects are soon going to be felt much closer to home. Now we turn our attention to Moldova, and in the normal course of things, it would be unusual for Moldova to find itself in the international spotlight. A nation of just 2.6 million people with a land area only slightly bigger than Maryland, Moldova is one of Europe's poorest countries. A tiny, post-Soviet state which few people could reliably place on a map. Yet, there's a reason why we're talking about Moldova right now. A reason why people as significant as U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz keep traveling there to meet its president, Ma Sandu. And that reason is that Moldova today stands right on the fault line between Russia and the West. A fault line that the country's upcoming elections are threatening to crack open. Taking place on October the 20th, polling day will see Moldovans vote on two distinct but related issues. The first is whether to grant President Sandu a second term. Perhaps the most pro-Western politician to ever lead Moldova, Sandu has overseen a sharp pivot to Europe, with the country even becoming an official candidate for joining the EU. Which leads us nicely to the second poll. Alongside their verdict on Sandu, Moldovans will also vote in a referendum on joining the EU. To be clear, the bloc isn't actually ready to admit just now, although accession talks are underway. Rather than see Brussels throw its arms wide open in welcome, a victory for the pro-Europeans would simply see plans to join the EU enshrined in the Moldovan constitution. But the comparatively low stakes don't mean this election isn't being watched closely for abroad. 
Nowhere is that more true than in Moscow, where the Kremlin seems determined to orchestrate a no vote to both Sandu and to closer ties with Europe. In recent weeks, National Police Chief Viral Sardatinu and National Security Advisor Stanislav Sekriru have both raised the alarm over Russian sabotage and hybrid tactics intended to rig the election. Over summer, the UK, US, and Canada even issued a joint warning over Kremlin-led plots to incite protests should Sandu win. And while polls currently show over 60% back yes on joining the EU, there are fears that a concerted campaign could still swing the result, especially given the precarious nature of the Moldovan state. So that sandwich between Romania and Ukraine, Moldova is both comparatively poor and comparatively corrupt. Transparency International ranks it as the 76th most corrupt nation on earth, ahead of Ukraine and Russia, but behind every single EU nation. On top of corruption and weak institutions, Moldova is also divided. Not in the sense of America's partisan divide, but in the sense that it is literally split between two governing entities. Following a brief but bloody war in 1992, the pro-Russian region of Transnistria broke away from Chisinau. Since then, a contingent of Russian peacekeepers have been stationed on its soil. Down in the south, the autonomous region of Gagauzia has likewise developed a pro-Kremlin bent even as it has opted to remain part of Moldova. The presence of a Russian-backed statelet amidst 60 kilometers from the capital frequently leads to bouts of serious worry. In 2022, when it briefly looked like Russia was going to seize the Ukrainian port city of Odessa, there were real fears that Moscow troops might follow up by annexing Transnistria. As The Economist noted, after that, it would likely be, quote, only hours before their tanks rolled into Chisinau, Moldova's capital, to install a puppet government. These fears aren't just the result of paranoia. The Russian government has frequently issued coded threats against the country, like when Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov compared Chisinau to Kiev as if to hint at future military action. Earlier this year, Transnistria's unrecognized government even issued a call to help from Moscow. As Chatamouse Think Tank explains, quote, This echoed similar appeals from inside Ukraine, which set in motion the illegal Russian annexations of its territories. Then there's the attempted energy coercion. For complicated reasons, Moldova gets about 80% of its energy from gas that's pumped from Russia across Ukraine and into Transnistria at a steep discount, with Transnistria then selling the electricity from its gas-fired plant to Moldova for profit. In autumn of 2022, though, Moscow cut gas volumes of the country by a third. Transnistria stopped selling its excess electricity, and energy prices in Moldova went through the roof. As a direct result, inflation hit an eye-watering 34%. Blackouts became common. It was only thanks to generous Western backing for spot market purchases that Moldova didn't completely implode that winter. So yeah, it's fair to say that Russia has form in trying to sabotage Chisinau. And while election interference this year has been less overt, evidence abounds that the Kremlin is using dirty tricks to try and rig the outcome. One trick is something we're all used to by now, good old-fashioned disinformation. The Foreign Policy Research Institute has documented deepfake videos on social media of things like President Sandu announcing an EU-directed ban on collecting rose hips, a Moldovan tradition as ingrained as Brits eating Marmite and complaining about the weather. Other videos have repurposed footage of Romanian military parades to suggest that Bucharest is about to launch a ground invasion of the country. Slightly further up the seriousness scale, there have been documented instances of teenagers being paid small amounts to do things like vandalize public buildings. Others have received instructions on provoking the police during a riot. Yet others have called in bomb threats at such a staggering volume as to effectively paralyze parts of the capital. Still, all of this has nothing on the campaign uncovered at the start of October. One in which a prominent pro-Russian businessman was caught offering tens of thousands of ordinary Moldovans cash to vote against President Sandu and joining the EU. That businessman is Ilan Shaw, a billionaire dual national of both Moldova and Israel who was convicted in absentia last year for large-scale banking fraud. A committed Putin fanboy, he previously headed a political party named after him until it was banned by the courts. According to police chief Varel Cernatinu, Shaw transferred over $15 million in September alone to Moldovan citizens to influence their votes. The independent Russian outlet, the Moscow Times, estimates that 70,000 voters were bribed in this way. Shaw, for his part, hasn't bothered to deny the operation, writing on Telegram that, quote, all payments are legal and Moldova has finally turned into a police state. Now, this isn't the first time that people connected to the Putin regime have tried to buy Moldovan votes. In local elections in 2023, Chatham House writes that Russia funneled up to $55 million into the country to influence the outcome. Now, Russia would likely try these sorts of shenanigans even if there was only a slight chance of swinging the vote. Witness the Russian disinformation campaign during the recent EU elections. But in Moldova, Putin would be almost mad not to try. The reason? 
Among Moldovans, there is a deeper base of pro-Russian sentiment that President Sandu would probably like to admit. To see what we mean, just take a look at some of the polling on the Ukraine war as reported by Crisis Group. When asked in 2023 whether Kiev was right in the conflict, only a third of Moldovans said yes. Other polls taken this summer showed 59% disagreeing with NATO's decision to arm Ukraine. The Foreign Policy Research Institute, meanwhile, writes that, quote, Part of the country is indeed pro-Russian. Moldova has a long-standing tradition of communist rule. Even after it became independent from the Soviet Union, it was led by a communist party and president for decades. Now, it's possible for someone to be both pro-Russian and in favor of joining the EU. Viktor Orban, for example, manages to stand for Putin while also refusing to do anything that might lead Hungary to withdrawing from the bloc. So, it's likely that some of those who reflexively side with Moscow will nonetheless vote for closer EU integration. Still, the potential for an election upset is there, not least because some regions, including especially Gagauzia, view President Sandy's westward dash as overhasty and ill-advised. Thankfully, outside nations are trying to help combat election interference. The US earlier in the year pledged 46 million euros to help counter disinformation, while Germany has emerged as a champion of Moldova's accession to the EU, in large part due to the number of German car manufacturers who've invested in local industry. More broadly, European nations are helping invest in connecting Moldova to Romania's energy grid in an attempt to minimize the leverage Moscow holds over the country. So, while it would be foolish to ignore the danger this Russian meddling poses, it's not guaranteed to get the results Putin wants. Yet, even if the Kremlin fails to swing the vote on October the 20th, that doesn't mean that Moldova will be out of the woods. Remember when we said how Moldova gets most of its energy from gas piped across Ukraine and into Transnistria? Well, the contract that allows Moscow to pump that gas through Ukraine expires on December the 31st, and Kyiv refuses to renew it. Although international partners are looking for workarounds, there's a semi-decent chance that come the end of 2024, those gas flows will shut off for good. If that happens, then the result will be a major crisis for both Moldova and Transnistria. On the Moldovan side, the new links to the Romanian grid are not yet finished, meaning oh, we could see another energy crisis like the one in 2022. On the Transnistrian side, the loss of revenues that comes from selling electricity to Moldova could send the economy off a cliff. Again, we should stress that it's entirely possible that a solution will be found, but if it's not, then it may almost not matter who wins the upcoming elections, because the greatest crisis Moldova has faced may still be around the corner, and it remains to be seen if Chisinau and its allies will be capable of overcoming it. Next up, we travel to the Persian Gulf, where the Arab nations of the region have spoken in unity about their position on the raging conflict between Israel on one side and Hamas, Hezbollah, and fundamentally Iran on the other. But rather than throw down the gauntlet in defense of either side, the Gulf states have chosen a different path. They've resolved that they're going to be staying out of this fight, and they'd like Iran to know it. Their message was delivered to Iran, one of the nations that claims coastal territory on the Persian Gulf, at a conference last week in the city of Doha. There, in the capital of the nation of Qatar, representatives of Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Amman, the United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait joined their hosts in a meeting with representatives of Iran's foreign ministry. At the top of the priority list for every attendee other than Iran was the goal of urgent de-escalation between Iran and Israel, but per sources speaking to the news bureau Reuters, Iran came in with a somewhat different objective. Iran has been giving subtle signs and signals for weeks, indicating that if its fellow Gulf states were to intervene directly in the conflict in a way that went against Iran's interests, then Israel would strongly consider targeting their assets in the region, including even the oil fields that the Gulf states rely on to fuel their own economies and fulfill much of the global need for fossil fuels. According to sources familiar with the summit in Doha, the Gulf states went out of their way during the meeting to assure Iran that they would not take Israel's side in the conflict, but they also insisted on taking something of a broader position on the war that, wherever it went, even in the case of a violent escalation between Iran and Israel directly, the nations of the Persian Gulf did not intend to intervene. During the events, Iran's president, Masoud Pajeshkian, went so far as to make public statements warning other nations against staying silent as Israel engages in, quote, warmongering, and any type of military attack, terrorist act, or crossing our red lines will be met with a decisive response by our armed forces. 
But by the word of sources at and around the meeting, the Gulf states were unmoved. No representatives of any of those nations have chosen to weigh in publicly on the issue. Now, it may come as a surprise to many people around the world that Iran would even be suspicious about the notion that countries like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, or famously neutral Oman would take sides against Iran. Certainly, even if they did participate in the conflict, they would come in on the side of Iran, right? But the reality in the Middle East has been more complicated than that for a very long time. Iran has had a contentious relationship with the Gulf states for decades, with the positive elements of those relationships usually focused around trade, but the negatives coming everywhere from economic competition to conflicting geopolitical interests to a cultural divide. Saudi Arabia especially has been locked into a regional rivalry with Iran for a very long time. The countries only recently restored their relations after several years of a complete and apparently quite mutual diplomatic cold shoulder. Meanwhile, two Gulf states normalized relations with Israel in 2020 after long having regarded Israel as the enemy. Those two nations, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, were widely regarded as a prelude to a potential normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia, something that Iran regarded as both a major economic threat and the potential seed for an Arab-Israeli alliance against Iran. While the Israel-Hamas war has put a stop to normalization talks between the Saudis and the Israelis for now, Saudi Arabia has indicated that it's still interested in normalization with certain preconditions, and this summer, IDF chief Herzi Halevi met secretly with Saudi Arabia. Arabia, Bahrain, and the Emirates in further attempts to work toward regional security cooperation. That meeting, and other indicators of the Gulf states' continued desire for close relations with Israel, are undoubtedly bad news for Iran, especially because, from a purely pragmatic perspective, the war between Israel and Iran backed Hamas creates an optics issue that prevents the Gulf states from pursuing normalization deals that they otherwise want. Also on Iran's mind is the prospect of a major Israeli airstrike that may be coming over the next few days, or that may have already happened by the time this episode goes out. That strike will be an act of retaliation against Iran after Iran launched some 200 ballistic missiles at Israel in early October as part of the two nations' ongoing hostilities. One set of targets that's thought to be on Israel's slate of options are Iran's own oil facilities, including the Karg oil terminal, handling over 90% of Iran's crude oil exports, but also the most important pieces of Iran's own domestic energy sector. In the event that the Gulf states were to take action to support Israel, that action wouldn't necessarily have to involve violence. If Israel takes out Iranian domestic oil production, then Iran will need to get its oil somewhere. And if Israel takes out Iran's export hubs, then Iran will need to get its money somewhere. The Gulf states can stand in the way of either objective. They can refuse to sell their oil to Iran, preventing Iran from even keeping the lights on as it runs through what oil reserves it has, or they can engage in collective manipulation of the global oil market, making it very difficult for Iran to recoup its financial losses. Either move would be a major hit to Iran, a nation that would struggle to support full-scale hostilities with Israel under the best of circumstances, let alone in a world where its main revenue source is badly diminished. Meanwhile, the Gulf states would even stand to gain by cutting Iran off, as they and the rest of the world's oil-rich nations could make even more money by using their spare oil capacity and filling the void that the loss of Iranian oil would leave behind. Those sellers would mostly be sending that oil to China, a nation that doesn't seem to particularly care where its oil comes from as long as that oil keeps on coming. But the action the Gulf states could take against Iran wouldn't have to strictly be economic in nature. For example, Iran has raised concerns since its Doha meeting about the Gulf states' potential to allow other nations to use their airspace and military bases against Iran. That might involve allowing Israeli jets to fly over, say, Saudi Arabia to strike Iran, or giving the US access to bases that are a short flight away from Tehran and could thus be used to launch American airstrikes on Iranian soil. Iran has warned that such a move would be, quote, unacceptable, but Iran's insistence on raising the issue at all suggests that it isn't exactly reassured by the meeting a few days prior. The Gulf can also provide Israel with intelligence that Iran would rather it didn't have. Just this year, according to the Times of Israel, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates reportedly passed along intelligence in advance of a massive combined drone and missile assault that Iran ultimately launched. And if the Gulf states decided to intervene directly in the war on Israel's side, then Iran would have major problems on its hands. 
In the skies, Saudi Arabia can field multiple hundreds of American-made F-15E strike eagles for attacks against ground targets, plus 150-odd European-made multi-role fighters, while the Emirates, Oman, and Bahrain can offer dozens of F-16s, and Qatar can supply dozens more strike eagles and the French Raphael. Saudi Arabia's seven naval frigates and nine corvettes could prove more than capable of blockading the Strait of Hormuz and the Gulf of Oman, cutting Iran off by sea even without the support of the other Gulf states and without calling in its close ally, the United States. Although Iran's air force and navy boast impressive numbers on paper, they're unlikely to be battle-ready. And while the Gulf states' ground armies are unlikely to be ready to wage an entire war on Iranian soil, they almost certainly wouldn't need to. In such an engagement, neither the Gulf states, nor Israel, nor any global powers would be likely to push for a march on Tehran. Instead, the goal would likely be to render Iran militarily impotent for the foreseeable future. The Gulf states plus their allies could accomplish from the air and on the sea. Frankly, just the US Navy's 5th Fleet alone, based in Bahrain, could probably do most of the job without the Gulf states' help, if that is, the Gulf states were to agree to such a possibility. And we emphasize the sheer firepower on hand in the Persian Gulf, both from the nations of the region and from the United States, to emphasize another key point. Iran is making a point of insisting that any acts that aid Israel would bring retribution against its Gulf neighbors. But it's an open question whether that threat is credible or whether it might just be all talk. Certainly, Iran has proven in the past that it can take direct action against fellow Gulf state nations. In 2019, for example, a strike that was claimed by Yemen's Houthi rebels, but almost certainly came from Iran, struck two key Saudi Arabian oil installations and temporarily knocked out some 5% of the world's oil supply as a result. In 2020, Iran hit three oil tankers in the Emirates, sending a powerful signal at that time too. But it's important to understand that what Iran is threatening now would be an act of retribution after Gulf states took some action to help Israel or its allies. Sure, the Gulf states must be aware that Iran could think they've done something when actually they haven't, but regardless, Iran now has three problems with actually pulling off a successful attack in retribution. First, the air defenses of the Gulf states tend to be pretty good. Second, they'd now be on the lookout for incoming projectiles, taking away Iran's element of surprise and making air interceptions more likely. And third, if the Gulf states already know and understand that their decision to cooperate or support Israel and its allies will result in retaliation, then they're now in a position to both anticipate the retaliation and plan their own retaliatory response in kind. Iran's threats against the Gulf states are clearly meant to deter them from taking action in the first place, but they are, at least outwardly, a transparently empty deterrent. The message Iran intended to send was some variation on, don't try it. What the Gulf states likely heard was new but unsurprising information that will inform their actions after making a move if they choose to make a move at all. Finally, it's worth stepping back for a moment and looking at the neutrality of the Gulf states as it relates to the Israel-Iran proxy conflict as a whole. When Hamas in Gaza launched its massive October 7th terror attack against Israel last year, the organization had several goals, not least to kill as many Israelis as they possibly could and to both abduct hostages and take revenge against Israel for past transgressions and its occupation of the West Bank. But that alone has never explained Hamas's actions, as the attacks of October 7 never stood a chance of doing damage to the Israeli state itself, just the ordinary Israelis that Hamas put in the crosshairs. Hamas chose to attack anyway, knowing that the retribution coming back from Israel would be crushing at a level far beyond anything Hamas could achieve. So why did they do it? One leading theory, shared among a wide range of international experts on the conflict, was that Hamas had hoped that the rest of the Middle East would see Israel's massive retaliation and come to the defense of the people of Gaza. On the one hand, this plan would have certainly relied on Iran, Hezbollah, and other Iranian proxies and allies coming to Gaza's aid. And there are some recent indicators to suggest that this was a response Hamas hoped to trigger directly. One Israeli intelligence official speaking to NBC News alleged in late September that Iran, Hezbollah, and its other proxies had intended to encircle Israel and wipe it out by 2040, but that Hamas acted early with its October 7th attacks, possibly trying to make its allies take action then instead of later. 
but there was also potential for such destruction to make other Middle Eastern nations, like Saudi Arabia, rethink the idea of normalizing with Israel or even dismiss the idea as having been fanciful before deciding to revert to their old positions and support Israel's adversaries. According to recent reporting by the New York Times, this is the continued goal of Hamas leader Yaha Sinwa, who, in hiding somewhere in Gaza, has become increasingly fatalistic and hellbent on starting a regional conflict, no matter what it may mean for the people of Gaza or his own Hamas organization. But now, in the waiting months of 2024, it's already clear that if this was Hamas's plan, then it has failed spectacularly. Iran is still not fully engaged in a conflict, Hezbollah is on the defensive and is taking a horrific beating in the early stages of Israel's northern offensive, and perhaps most important of all, the states of the Persian Gulf remain unmoved. The fact that Iran now feels compelled to threaten the Gulf states just to keep them neutral in the conflict indicates that by Iran's judgment, there is little to no chance they'd ever enter hostilities on Iran's side. And if the Gulf states don't remain neutral as Iran asks, then it's they who might make Hamas's plan truly impossible to realize. With the help of the Gulf states, Israel and the US would be able to effectively keep the bulk of Iran's military forces out of any escalating conflict, and after that happens, it's highly unlikely that Iran's proxies could pose much more of a threat to Israel than they already have. Thank you for watching.